is it vis visual to you? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if I do play, should I wait to do that maybe? Um, yeah, I think, I think you can wait a second. Yeah. Uh, Let's give a, a couple more minutes so people can come in. Yeah, uh, there's still people coming in. Yeah, so. I think it's probably good if you write in that general chat on Gather because the students were asking me when it was going to start, and I said I didn't know. Yeah, I think I think Diego made an announcement, right, Diego? Oh, okay. Uh, at any rate, uh, we're kind of live on YouTube. Everybody's coming back. Everybody's coming back. Just one okay. minute. We're kind of live on YouTube already, so uh, let's Are not we? talk. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, bom dia, Siddhartha. Bom dia, Mestre Tarcísio. Parabéns bom. pela organização, tá muito legal. O, o, o pessoal tá curtindo pra caramba o Gather, né? É legal, é bem Olha, legal. Olha, o Gather, cara, o Gather é bom, viu? É. Eu não, estou muito surpreso, positivamente surpreso. Achava que não ia... A ilusão Isso. não ia funcionar, mas funciona. É. Já funciona. se perdeu no Water Maze, Siddhartha? Não. <risos> já foi lá? Tem um Water Maze. Tu já foi? Pô, eu fiquei, eu fiquei preso lá dentro, cara. <risos> se eu fosse Conseguiu lá, achar? Eu sei o qual quadrante que tá, fosse... entendeu? Não, a gente teve que fazer um trabalho em equipe. Tava eu Liga e do Zap, só me tira daqui. É, não, tava eu e a André lá dentro, a gente falou... Tu explora por cima, eu exploro por baixo, e teve uma hora que eu saí. É. Ah, muito bom, muito, muito bom, muito bom. Mas a, a, o fato da gente se mover junto, ir para um lugar e para o outro, isso cria uma. Isso coloca um, o sabor da interação social em jogo mesmo, né? É. É, a, 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 a diferença principal vai ser notada agora durante os posters, né? Então, o que vai possibilitar isso. Essa, essa interação individual, individualizada, simultânea, de 25 pessoas, de 25 pôsteres. Isso, uhum. isso é ótimo, é fantástico. Além dessas conversas né, paralelas ali que você pode ter com as pessoas, sentar na mesa, conversar, contar uma história e ninguém eu, te ouvir. Eu fiquei pensando, Tarcísio, se tinha algum jeito de configurar o Gather para você dar aula nele de tal maneira que aconteça a seguinte coisa. O professor fica dando aula, e você senta do lado das pessoas que você quer passar aula conversando. Aí você Ei, fica conversando, pode. passa aula conversando com quem você quer, assistindo a aula ali, que é o que acontece na aula mesmo, né? Você fica ali, só que oh, sem incomodar. O, o DVD Sim, precisa é... ter grupos para fazer tarefas? Isso? Não, eu pensei mesmo Sim, assim. Não. Aula, Bia, como é, a gente eu acho que tudo isso lá. Como a gente assiste a aula. Veja no ambiente da leitura. É, dá uma olhadinha no... Isso. Eu não sei é... se quando alguém está falando, Diego, você pode Mas... conversar lá no auditório. Sim, sim. Porque aqui pode ter vários espaços privados dentro do auditório. Isso. Aí tem que ver se... Aí imagina que você vai escutar mesmo assim. Aí dá para conversar, depois a gente pode revisar. Isso. É, eu estava afim de dar aula nesse semestre lá já. <risos> Boa. Eu tá também. Um auditório. Eu queria usar o auditório para dar aula. É. Vai. Só, Só se você tiver vai... menos de 25 pessoas. É, ah, mas não vai ter mais de 25 pessoas, não. É. Bom, não sei, talvez. É. Acredito que. Só pode ser 25, é? Isso. De graça, é, né? Eu, eu também quero deixar o título. O título vai ficar aberto depois do imposto. Então vai ficar num lugar de reunião assim, aberto. De graça, né? 25 pessoas. Mas sim, sim vamos explorar e fazer sala de aula dentro do Instituto. Pois é, as nossas turmas não tem mais de 25 pessoas, raramente é. tem, né? Vamos fazer é, uma realmente. sala de aula, aí você já marca, tipo, ah, na sala 2 de aula. <risos> Exato, exatamente. Tá, é. tá, a gente conversa aí, faz uma... Tá, beleza, tá ótimo. Uh... All right, I think, I think it's time. For, well, uh, welcome to the second session of the day, uh, of uh, the sixth um, house symposium. And I would like to... Um, to invite uh, our, our faculty, uh, Catarina Leon, to uh, be the first uh, speaker of this um, first session of the day. Catarina, welcome. Thank you for agreeing to speak to us. And uh, the floor is yours, or the screen is yours, I should say. <laughs> OK, thank you so much. Uh, let me then start my presentation and see if it works. If it doesn't, you just let me know, I hope. So, uh, 
I'm really happy to be part of Instituto Cerebro and this fantastic uh, house symposium in the virtual world. It's very exciting. Today, I'm going to tell you about uh, physiological markers of noise-induced tinnitus uh, in mice and possible targets for treatments. So we're moving away from the rats and their social uh, behaviors and going to the mice and their responses to sound. So in general, what's a big problem for tinnitus research is that there is a lack of biomarkers for tinnitus. So if a person experiences, for example, noise-induced tinnitus, which is fairly common, 10 to 15 percent of the world population, and I presume many of you have uh, had the experience that after going to a loud concert, for example, that you hear this beep for a couple of minutes or hours, for example, but usually disappears. But for some people, this becomes chronic and can be quite stressful and um, and disturb normal life. You can feel that you cannot listen in, in social uh, gatherings. This can create social anxiety. You can maybe not focus on work as you want. And all these things might add up to you coming depressed and not function properly um, at all. So for one or two percent uh, of the world population, uh, tinnitus is so the, um, problematic when bothersome that they really seek medical help to be able to live their daily lives. But when you go to doctor, you cannot really have the doctor diagnose you for having tinnitus. You have to describe what you are hearing, this ringing of noise or, or sound in your head. Um, you have to describe it and try to characterize it, but we cannot measure it that well if it is a subjective tinnitus. But there's some work starting to show that maybe there's some genetics that we can find genetic markers. So there was a paper a couple of years ago uh, going for the time to biobank phantom sounds and looking at twin studies in humans. And they could see that, for example, bilateral tinnitus in men was almost as high in her heritability as there is for autism among twin pairs, for example, and also for for, for women, there's uh, some certainty of uh, heritability. So there are some genes, but we don't know exactly which ones, and it's far away from being able to use this as a test. And then just another general thing to complain about in the research world is the lack of funding. So here's just an example, also from my collaborator in Sweden, uh, where they looked at how many papers are published in the US or in the, in the EU, and rest of the world on tinnitus. And there's uh, quite an, many papers, but there are very few in animal studies. Mostly it's, it's focused on humans because there are few perfect models for, for uh, noise-induced tinnitus, for example. And when you look at the funding and compare it to a disease like diabetes, for example, the funding of tinnitus research is uh, ridiculously low. So, we're dealing with, with a condition that affects a lot of people, and for some people can be extremely bothersome, but we don't hardly even have a way to detect it properly, and there's very little research going on on it. Uh, for some reason, I went backwards. There we go. So what do we know about the neuronal correlates of noise-induced tinnitus? What do we know from animal studies? Well. Uh, it's fairly certain that the dorsal cochlear nucleus or the cochlear nucleus here in A has a lot of neurons that play a part in noise-induced tinnitus. In the dorsal portion, the excitatory neurons increase their excitability and inhibitor neurons decrease uh, firing. So we get a first stage of imbalance. And if you look at the larger uh, auditory pathways in B in this uh, review, all the way up to the auditory cortex, we see that there is uh, several levels of the brain circuitry that shows increased excitability, like the inferior colliculus up to the, the auditory thalamus, and also increased firing in the auditory uh, cortex. And you can also see that, that the tinnitus might become bilateral uh, because of this crossing over also. So for sure, there are neuronal correlates of noise-induced tinnitus. And we have actually looked a little bit closer on that in our group. This is uh, just some work by Ingrid. Uh, she looked at subtypes of 
neurons in the auditory cortex, uh, only in layer five. And we did um, noise overexposure. And then one week later, she cut slices of the, of the brain. And she did whole cell patch clamp to compare properties between two main types, the large type A and the smaller type B uh, layer five pyramidal cells. And here she could see that most features were similar between the cell types, but in the noise exposed animals, there was a shift in how they respond to depolarizations. So the type A cell would actually fire slower while the type B cell would increase its firing to the same type of input. So there seemed to be some kind of um, um, dual way on how the auditory cortex uh, regulates this uh, overexposure of noise. So for sure, this also adds to the complexity of studies when it's not just in general an increase in activity. Another part that adds to the complexity is that it's not just the auditory pathways that uh, might be involved in tinnitus. So first again, the cochlear nucleus here in the bottom, which is the first area of the brain that receives and computes sound. As I just described to you, going all the way up to the primary auditory cortex um, and also projecting downwards feedback, of course, this might be our tinnitus perception. But then we also have, for example, the cochlear nucleus uh, being involved with um, acoustic startle response that we jump in response to a large, noise, large or loud noise. And we also have the path uh, that can lead to fear memories uh, through the entorhinal cortex. So noise induced tinnitus is very likely to cause both the perception of sound, but also the fear of sound. And this is something that you can see in many humans that they're avoiding a situation where there might be loud sounds because they have tinnitus, which makes no sense because it might not worsen it, it's just some kind of fear response. So it's for sure large parts of the brain that are involved with things like um, dealing with noise and maybe noise induced tinnitus. So can we somehow extract this activity and make it into some kind of biomarker. That is the dream scenario, obviously very ambitious, but we're starting to poke in this area. So we decided to look at a feature that's called sensory filtering, uh, which we can kind of uh, boil down to auditory attention. And that is something you can measure in humans. And we wanted to know if this is altered in a model of noise induced tinnitus. So it's obvious that, uh, for example, uh, modification of cortical synapses can uh, alter sensory perception. So if then tinnitus is a long-term modification, are we uh, modifying perception of, of sound? Um, and this has been shown in human studies, but with some conflicting results, but there is some attentional conflicts in patients with ten tinnitus, for example. And then as a second part of this talk, uh, I'm also going to mention anxiety. Can anxiety be some kind of readout of noise induced tinnitus? Because the tests to, for, for mice to try to identify tinnitus are complicated, but maybe adding this anxiety component can help us to define better research models of anxiety. And here's some work by Jessica and Hishardson from the Institute together with uh, several other um, co-workers and Jessica showed that there is some anxiety-like behavior that is uh, induced by the salicylate model of tinnitus and this can be helped by uh, using low dose of psychedelics as an uh, anxiolytic uh, agent. So this is the work of Hichardson Leon's lab but still very, very interesting because it shows that indeed there is anxiety components uh, related to tinnitus-like behavior. But then just to add on to these studies, uh, we wanted to also add on a bit of pharmacology and something that is getting a lot of attention lately is the endocannabinoid system or cannabinoid drugs. And we have the, the the advantage that we uh, have 
the approval to work with cannabis extracts now on, at the Institute. And here uh, we are comparing in the first hypothesis about uh, auditory attention. We're testing both the nicotine and cannabis extract. Nicotine is classically known to improve sensory filtering, for example, in, in schizophrenia patients. And uh, the endocannabinoid system has this modulatory role on many uh, higher um, uh, higher uh, processing of the brain. And we try the same because uh, there is this knowledge that cannabis can be both anxiolytic and anxiogenic. This is a lot of literature is now showing the difference of the dose and the difference of the age, how that matters. So we kind of start looking at this too here. So it's uh, two layers of this hunt for biomarkers. So hypothesis number one, uh, this is the work by a very talented PhD student in my lab, Barbara Sirali, uh, with the hypothesis, hypothesis, nicotine and cannabis extract alters sensory gating in noise exposed mice. So what she has been done is to create an animal, animal model of noise induced tinnitus without hearing loss. So uh, all mice have gone through all stages of the experiments. This is the experimental timeline. She uh, needs to hab habituate the animals. So she can then perform what we call the tinnitus test, but it's a startle test where mice are tested, tested if they can detect a silent gap in background uh, sound as a little warning cue for a, a, lo a loud startle pulse. So the mice that can detect the silence, they are included in the test. And then she does auditory brainstem recordings to measure the hearing threshold to make sure the hearing is normal. And then she has divided mice into sham or noise exposure to have um, a model for noise induced tinnitus. And then two days later, she tests the auditory threshold again to see that she didn't cause a hearing loss and here in the lower left side is the results just showing uh, before and after in black and red for the sham treated and the noise exposed mice. And there is no difference in any frequency tested in hearing threshold, which is good because that's how we would like the study to be. Then on the next day, the tinnitus test is performed again. And here the result in the lower right uh, panel is comparing sham and noise exposed mice and it shows that um, sham mice before the noise exposure and the same as for the noise exposed animals they are quite good at suppressing this startle po po pulse when they hear this little silence in background noise uh, and the sham can do this again, but for the noise exposed mice, they become very bad at detecting this silence in the background noise, which we extrapolate to the idea that maybe the tinnitus is filling in this gap. Um, so that's the test we have to try to say that there is a tinnitus perception. But of course, we cannot know for sure. It could just be a, a, a worse detection of a silence. Um, but anyway, this is the test we are using. And then how can we now look at sensory gating? For that, we're gonna use auditory event-related potentials and we're gonna generate them in response to paired clicks. And this has been shown many times before and it's convenient because it's also measurable in humans. So when you have a repetitive stimuli, your brain usually re um, responds to the second click with a smaller potential. So Sensory gating is a neurophysiological measure of inhibition that is characterized by a reduction of the P50 event related potential to a repeated identical stimulus. So this has been used a lot for schizophrenia research where they, uh, schizophrenic, schizophrenic patients have a poorer sensory filtering. In black would be the trace for normal uh, individual showing a large response after the first click and a smaller response after the second, while the gray trace is showing uh, for a schizophrenic patient that there is no difference in magnitude. And this has been used to create several uh, animal models of uh, 
schizophrenia in test treatments in mice, because then we can stick an electrode in the hippocampus, which is a good place to pick up a, a strong auditory event related potential. So that's going from humans to mice, and that is what we wanted to use. So Barbara went ahead and she manufactured uh, her electrodes herself. She made them um, in a depth profile so she can get a signal from different um, locations within the hippocampus. And this is useful because we wanted to compare the same signal between animals, between pharmacological treatments. So we always analyze the channel before phase reversal. So this is when the response to the first click and the second click points downwards and it's above the one where they point upwards. So this is just due to uh, the anatomical structure of the hippocampus, but it becomes a very useful um, tool for uh, summarizing data and making sure that you're picking up the signal uh, from the same place between animals. So Barbara did this for, uh, uh, I think, 30 animals in total. And first of all, we could see that noise exposed animal, they still have the capability of obviously <laughs> responding to the paired clicks. And they also have a large first amplitude and a smaller second amplitude. But now we wanted to quantify this um, by summarizing between um, several animals. And these auditory event related potentials are created from 50 repetitions also. And then you can measure a negative deflection uh, N40 and a positive deflection P80. So uh, the numbers representing in milliseconds, more or less the latency of the peak. So for sham treated animals, they show the normal uh, suppression of the second click. So they are significantly different and quite uh, similar between animals. But when we look at the noise exposed group, we see that there's a larger spread, especially uh, here for the response to the first click. And now um, averaging the data, we don't see a significant difference anymore. So even though they have the, uh, the same reduction that the controls have, uh, the magnitude is a little bit different. And um, we wanted to understand this in more detail. But we also wanted to see if provoking the system with nicotine, as I mentioned, and cannabis, if that also um, alter sensory filtering. So here is just the same, but for all the conditions. So she randomized, sorry, uh, saline or nicotine in the beginning. And then um, 48 hours later, she did the cannabis injection 30 minutes before recording and then recording the response to the paired clicks and then straight after she added uh, nicotine and recorded again uh, five minutes later as cannabis extract uh, remains in the blood for a bit longer we could do the summative effect of the two drugs in that day and the cannabis extract that we are using is uh, high in thc uh, these are doses that are maybe more seen for treating epilepsy in children and so on, um, but has been used in other studies of uh, actually nicot nicotine dependency, for example. So what did we find? Uh, well, we saw that also in noise exposed animals, jumping here straight to the middle, that nicotine has... Uh, a positive effect that it also improves uh, the difference the, between the first and the click, uh, first and the second click response. But then we saw something unexpected, which is that cannabis extract and nicotine together uh, strongly improves this uh, difference, the ratio between them, something that cannabis extract alone did not in the noise exposed mice, but actually did for the sham. So here we are just summarizing this as the suppression of the second peak. And for sham in green and noise exposed in blue, we can see that it was uh, mainly having a large effect in noise exposed animals, this uh, cannabis plus nicotine treatment. 
And looking at this in a little bit more detail, because the literature often tries to figure out if a certain drug has improved, has increased the magnitude or decreased the magnitude of either click one or click two. So Barbara separated all these uh, results and she found that for the noise exposed mice, it's basically an effect on the first click that we're seeing where the, uh, the two drugs together uh, improves the, or increases the amplitude of the N40 response. And there's no alteration for the second click. While in sham animals, um, the drugs together uh, increases the amplitude of the first and the second click. So that's why the ratio between them doesn't appear to, uh, to change. Uh, for the P80 peak, there was no difference at all. And for latency of these uh, responses, there was a difference um, for um, the cannabis plus nicotine for the noise exposed, but then there was also some uh, difference in latency for cannabis uh, for the sham group. So these are obviously results we have to dig deeper into and try to figure out what is the normal response and what can be uh, related to noise exposure. But uh, we were happy that we could at least uh, start to quantify some data. So just preliminary results, but we found that nicotine and cannabis extract plus nicotine can improve sensory filtering in noise exposed mice. And this is probably related to the increased amplitude of latent and latency of click one. And cannabis extract plus nicotine uh, showed increased amplitude of both click one and click two in sham treated animal and thereby not changing the event related potential race ratio. So uh, now to just mention a few more things in the second study is this has been done by Rodolfo Dionos, uh, who is a master student in the lab. Uh, he has looked if low dose cannabis extract can decrease tinnitus and incite like behavior in mice. So here uh, we actually have the uh, HPLC uh, response of the, of the extract showing this high peak in THC. But here, Rodolfo diluted the extract to have a much lower dose, uh, one milligram per kilo of THC, because uh, some recent study has shown that um, even five milligrams uh, per kilo can be anxiogenic. So we try to go to the anxiolytic um, concentrations. And he has also done several experiments of handling, habituation, the same type of test to see if the mice can detect a silent gap before um, a startle pulse. And then he has also used noise exposure or sham. And then he has retested the mice uh, for this detection of the gap, either with vehicle or cannabis extract. Um, and then one week later, he has also tested for anxiety related behavior in the open field and the elevated plus maze. So what Rodolfo found was that uh, noise exposed mice have a harder time to detect the silent gap. Uh, but this was not super clear because comparing the sham to the noise exposed group, uh, we saw a lot of variability amongst animals. So when we subdivide them into more typical uh, the suppression and then actually the failure to suppress the startle pulse, we divide them with a cutoff of 45% uh, to the exposed tinnitus mice. And then we have one group that were exposed to noise, but did not develop tinnitus-like responses. And this has also been seen previously in literature. Um, what uh, Rodolfo did differently from Barbara was that he had the mice uh, awake during the noise exposure, while Barbara and Tawan, that have done these experiments previously, have done the the noise exposure during uh, anesthesia. So here we might have some uh, fear component that uh, we haven't seen in the other studies. But just to sum it up quickly, uh, what Rodolfo could see when he compared uh, behavior in the open field where he's filming the mice walking for 10 minutes. And here you can see an example of the tracing of the locomotion. 
is that uh, sham and noise exposed animals, um, they apparently, apparently cross the center, both of them, but if you look at travel distance, the noise exposed walk a little bit less. And then when comparing the result in response to cannabis extract, uh, he found that the noise exposed animals showed a more anxio, uh, anxiogenic or anxiety related behavior of avoiding the center of the arena. Uh, so nicotine, sorry, cannabis extract uh, made them avoid the center areas. When looking at elevator, elevated plus maze, um, it got a little bit more um, confusing because here we see that the noise exposed mice enter the closed arms less than the sham treated animals. So there is not as clear preference for the closed arm as the open arms. But if uh, they are injected with a um, low dose of cannabis extract, they, um, uh, they stay longer in the closed arms. So this is a little bit, uh, well, what's missing here is the subdivision into the tinnitus-like uh, responses and the noise exposed, not uh, tinnitus-like responses. And Rodolfo has already got this data on his poster, but I didn't have time to include it in the talk yet. But it shows that we have to dig a bit deeper into the details to understand this but there was clearly no anxiolytic effect of the cannabis extract uh, even at this low dose in these mice unfortunately uh, so the results of hypothesis two would be that noise exposed mice walk less in the open field and avoids the center area after cannabis extract administration noise exposed mice enter less in the closed arms of the elevated plus maze and after cannabis extract, noise exposed mice stay more time in the closed arms compared to vehicle administration. And here we would like to keep going in this research and look at lower doses, it should say, uh, lower doses of cannabis extract. And especially look at age related effects because these mice are kind of adolescent mice and there's lots of differences between adolescent and um, adult mice both in CB1 receptor density and the enzymes that can help break down endocannabinoids, for example. So to conclude, um, did we find any physiological markers of noise-induced tinnitus? Well, um, maybe auditory event-related potentials could serve as a biomarker just by the larger first-click amplitude. So that's something we can dig a little bit deeper into the literature and see if we can find what would be the be the specific correlates of this and if this is something we could uh, study more in detail perhaps using of genetics or chemogenetics and for the anxiety tests as a complement to tinnitus tests um, perhaps the fact that they walk less in the open field um, could be something interesting to to see again and targets for treatments uh, is the endocannabinoid system interesting here? Well, it can be interesting for sensory filtering since it appear, apparently improves the sensory filtering uh, at the doses we studied here. Uh, but at the low dose, we did not see any improvement in tinnitus related um, behavior, nor did we see any anxiolytic, anxiolytic effect. So, uh, I would like to thank uh, the hard work of, of Barbara Sirali and of Rodolfo Diogenes. They have uh, done excellent work. Um, and I would very much like to thank uh, Professor Claudio Queiroz and Sergio Hushi and Igor Salas for the donation, analysis, and those calculations of cannabis extract. And I'm very um, lucky to work in the neurodynamics unit together with Tawan Ingrid, Tiago, Jessica, Richardson, Ailton, Rafael, Margaret, Marcus, uh, Brisa, and I hope I didn't forget someone, but it's a fantastic environment. And also thank you to Instituto do Cerebro, technicians, staff, students, and professors. It's a pleasure to be included uh, in the Institute. So thank you so much. 
Thank you very much, Kia. Um, we're now open for, for questions. If anybody has, uh, has questions for, for, for Kia, please um, raise your hand or just open your mic. Hi, Kia, may I, may I ask something? Yes. Thanks for the nice talk. It's great to see that uh, other research, other researchers are using cannabis to test uh, its positive or potential therapeutic effect. Um, but my question has nothing to do with cannabis. I think you have a lot of data and uh, it's, it's really to, to understand what's going on and the interaction between cannabis and nicotine. Um, but my question is regarding the analysis of variability uh, among animals. So do you have the uh, ERP, so the evoked related potential in the same animals that you test the behavior? And if so, can you correlate these two measures, whether well, to show that animals with low starter response or let's say or, or adaptation or habituation of the, the, the starter response, do correlate with changes in the amplitude between the first and the second post? Do you have this uh, data? So the, the paired click is done in freely moving awake mice. Uh, and we have filmed them during this. So we have this data actually. Um, and so your question was, if we see behavioral differences in how they are moving in the cage? No, because you showed changes in, in the, 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 between amplitude. the amplitude of yeah, yeah. 40 and, and 80, or a change of the other way around, like the, in 80. And, yeah. but you showed changes in, in, the, in the ratio, right, between the two. But you also showed changes uh, or variability in the amount of starter response, right? Ah, you mean like, um, yes. And the behavioral, like... You yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we were actually thinking here in the, in the, that they were much larger responses uh, in the noise exposed animals. Um, so, so for example, in this graph, can you correct, do you, do you imagine plausible to, to, to that there is a correlation between the, this uh, voltage, um, parameter so the, so the, the voltage of the listening and the voltage of jumping in the yeah system. the amount of yeah. jumping yeah, yeah no we have not correlated that for individually for mice that's a good idea actually it's interesting yeah, because then you can i mean you strength your hypothesis that the the, the evoked really uh, evoked potential in the brainstem or in the hippocampus mm. uh, explain or at least correlates with the amount or yeah. intensity of the starter response. And then you can see whether animals treated with cannabis or cannabis plus nicotine, they move away from this correlation in, in either Shen or uh, mm -hmm. uh, in noise-induced tinnitus. And uh, I think it would be very nice to, to, to treat this variance, this huge variance that you were showing. Very good suggestion. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we will do, or Barbara will do. <laughs> What Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Claudio. Uh, thank you, Kia. Anybody else? I already saw Kia's talk a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago, so I already made all my questions uh, yeah. there. So I want to leave, uh, let uh, other people do. Um, but if not, I would like to thank you, Kia. And um, we'll move to our next speaker, which is... Um, um, Professor Marcus, Marcus Costa. Thank you so much, Marcus, uh, for for being here with us and um, and sharing your your work. Um, I think uh, you can share your screen yep. if you want to. And uh, and the, the again, the screen is yours. Okay. Okay. Does it work? Do you see my screen? See. Sí. Okay, so I can make this full screen. All right, so first of all, I want to thank, to thank uh, Tarcizu and Diego for putting together this gather meeting. Uh, it's a very interesting experience. And uh, yeah, being uh, away from you for a long time now, 
it's very nice to be uh, together, at least virtually. Of course, it would be better to be there and see you personally, but it's already something to see you all here. And uh, it would be also a pleasure to, to present some of the work that we are doing here uh, in the Institute Pasteur de Lille, that it's now our uh, extension of the Brain Institute in France. So uh, today we'll be talking uh, about the role of BIN1, that it's one of the AD risk genes, Alzheimer's disease risk genes identified in genomic studies. And uh, I will mostly be talking about our results that are still unpublished, uh, about the role of these genes in regulating neuron act uh, electrical activity in human neurons. So since I'm now changing dramatically the, the topic, I will very briefly uh, introduce uh, some uh, information that I'm sure you all know, but just to, to um, put in the context the work that we are doing. So Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause of dementia, and uh, dementia is a very broad uh, term used to, to uh, define um, different uh, cognitive impairments. And uh, it's known that Alzheimer's disease corresponds to about 60 to 8% of all dementia cases and some other uh, causes are uh, body Lewy dementia and vascular dementia and other diseases such as Parkinson and Huntington's. And clinically, uh, we know that uh, patients that will develop Alzheimer, they have a preclinical stage where they don't show any symptom of cognitive impairment. And uh, then they move for some mild cognitive impairments. And then finally, uh, more severe um, symptoms that then can be classified into mild, moderate, and severe uh, dementia. In the whole world, uh, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is pretty high. And uh, of course, the, the numbers are more um, prominent in the European countries and the uh, in, in United States. But if we adjust the prevalence by age, uh, we see a very interesting uh, picture that uh, Brazil and, and Turkey becomes now the, the, the countries with the highest prevalence. Um, and uh, so this shows that it's not only a, a, a health problem for rich countries, but also for uh, developing uh, countries, uh, including Brazil. Physiopathologically, uh, Alzheimer's disease has been uh, originally characterized by two uh, hallmarks. The first one, the accumulation of the tau protein in a hyperphosphorylated uh, state uh, forming the so-called neurofibrillary tangles and the accumulation of the uh, amyloid beta peptides in uh, so-called amyloid plaques uh, or senile plaques. And these two um, alterations are observed in the brain uh, of patients um, with Alzheimer's disease. More recently, uh, in the last 10 years, but mostly in the last five years, uh, many studies have uh, suggested that uh, patients during mild cognitive impairments, and even uh, in some studies in the preclinical stage, they would show some uh, electrophysiological alterations in the brain, including, for example, epileptiform activity, especially during sleep, uh, and also more recently, changing the uh, a gamma oscillation band. And this is very uh, interesting because this could suggest that uh, in the initial stage of the disease, uh, there would be changes in the neuronal uh, electrical uh, activity and connectivity that could somehow um, predict the change that uh, will happen in, uh, in, in the cognitive behavior in future years. Uh, regarding the etiology of Alzheimer's disease, uh, we can classify the, the disease in two main groups, the familial case, where 
we can identify a very clear genetic component uh, characterized by mutations in the APP, that it's the amyloid precursor protein, uh, or the presinilin 1 and 2, that are two proteins involved in the gamma secretase pathway that uh, process APP towards generation of amyloid beta peptides. And these are uh, causal genes. So meaning that if you have the mutations that are uh, identified in these genes, uh, you, you develop the disease. And usually this case of Alzheimer's disease, they are of early onset, meaning that they start at early stage. Uh, um, usually this is defined as lower than 60 years old. Um, However, these familial cases, they represent a very low number of cases. So it's about 1% of all Alzheimer's disease case. And the, the far most frequent uh, form of Alzheimer's disease is the so-called sporadic or late onset uh, Alzheimer's disease that starts after 60 years. And it's in the sporadic AD, it's a multifactorial disease where age is the most important uh, uh, component affecting the, the risk, but there is also very strong genetic um, background, very uh, genetic influence that some studies uh, um, um, in twins suggest that can be between 60% of the whole uh, uh, risk. Um, however, uh, now when we look the genetic uh, genetics of this uh, uh, the late onset Alzheimer's disease, we are not talking about causal genes any longer, we are now talking about risk genes, meaning that we are talking about uh, genetic variations that may increase or decrease the risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. And in the last years, um, many uh, genome-wide association studies have uh, identified um, the, the genes associated with the risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, in the most recent uh, work that we are now um, trying to publish, uh, we identified 42 new uh, risk loci. So this, we have now about 75 risk loci, loci uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease and more than 500 genes likely uh, associated with the risk to develop Alzheimer's disease. And among these genes, we can see here, uh, APOE is by far the most important one, but we have here been one that after APOE is the second uh, strongest association hit in these genome association studies. And in a, a recent work uh, performed by Diego Maxuelo in the, in the bioinformatics uh, in the um, uh, Universidad in the UFRN, uh, we showed that BIN1 uh, is expressed mainly by oligodendrocytes and microglial cells, but also by glutamatergic and GABAergic cells in the adult human brain. And we see also uh, that uh, in different data sets um, where um, RNA seq from the uh, Alzheimer's disease brain and health individuals was sequenced, we see that BIN1 expression is decreased. So this shows that uh, not only um, BIN1 is associated in the, in the genomic uh, studies, but we also see changes in the brain of patients, what could suggest that BIN1 is being involved in the pathology. So BIN1 uh, encodes for the bridge integrator 1 protein, and this is a very um, diverse protein. So there are more than 10 isoforms described and uh, seven isoforms of BIN1 uh, have been described as brain specific and uh, mostly neuronal specific. They contain this CLAP domain that's associated with membrane curvature and also uh, SH3 domain that with other proteins, for example, can interact with tau. Uh, there is also muscle specific uh, isoform and a more ubiqu ubiquitous uh, isoform, such as isoform 9 and 10. Uh, the role of BIN1 in, in Alzheimer's disease is still not completely understood, uh, but there are many studies showing that BIN1 can uh, interact with tau and regulate tau phosphorylation. Uh, 
there are also some suggestions that it can regulate APP trafficking by regulating endocytosis and by doing so regulate uh, a amyloid beta production and uh, also some uh, this more in, not in the brain but in the heart showing that B1 regulates localization of calcium voltage gated uh, channels and this can uh, also affect the uh, calcium dynamics in the cells and in the in microglia or microphage uh, regulate the inf immune inflammatory response. Recently, uh, knockouts and uh, overexpression experiments in, in rodents, in vivo and in vitro, uh, have also suggested that B1 can regulate different processes associated with neuronal communication, including electrical um, activity and synaptic transmission. So based on that, we uh, hypothesized that the altered expression of B1 that is observed in the human brain, um, likely in neurons, uh, could be uh, leading to alterations in the electrical activity and synaptic connectivity in these cells. To test that, uh, we need to generate human neurons. And uh, to do that, we use uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells that allows uh, generation of neurons in different contexts, such as uh, pure neuronal cultures, mixed neuronal astrocyte cultures, and organoids. And I, as I will show, we use all these three different models to address different um, uh, effects that the, the lesion of BIN1 uh, can have in neuronal activity. Um, so our strategy was to use uh, isogenic iPS cell lines and the advantage of using isogenic iPS cell lines compared to patient-derived iPS cells is that here we can be sure that we are only looking uh, uh, to the mutation in the BIN1 that we do, and we don't need to care about other genetic uh, change that surely exist when you study patient-derived cells. So uh, we used uh, iPS cell line, and we used CRISPR-Cas9 to um, delete a small region, the exon 3, that it's common to all isoforms of BIN1. And by doing so, we generated uh, iPS cells um, with mutation in the two alleles, so the being one knockout cells. And we also generated heterozygous cells that has a mutation only in one allele. And as you can see here in the Western blot, um, our uh, Y type cells express normal levels of being one. Uh, in the knockout, we don't see being one. In the heterozygous, we have a decrease in the being one expression. Uh, and all the cell lines, they express to report and cell markers such as SOX2 and SSA4. Uh, we then differentiate these iPS cells into neuroprogenitor cells. Um, in this stage, we detected that B1 knockout cell lines have a small decrease in cell proliferation. Um, but despite this decrease in the proliferative capacity, they can be passage up to 10 uh, passages and they differentiate into uh, human induced neurons and human induced astrocytes uh, under differentiated conditions. And uh, we see that the capacity to, to differentiate into neurons and astrocytes is similar between Y types and knockout cells. And here's just some examples of these uh, mixed cultures at four weeks, stained for astrocytic marker GFAP, neuronal marker MAP2 and nesting for and neuroprogenitor cells or immature astrocytes. And here MAP2 and tau showing that uh, we also have some already at four weeks, some uh, signs of neuronal polarization uh, in the culture. Uh, again, we confirm the deletion of being one in the knockout cell lines. And we also see something interesting that uh, from NPCs to the differentiated culture. Uh, and here it's only four weeks of differentiation, but we can already observe the, the shift in the uh, uh, expression pattern of the different B1 isoforms, indicating that this alternative splicing generated the heavy uh, isoforms, B1, isoform one and two, for example, they are happening only when neurons are uh, differentiating the culture. Next, uh, we performed single cell RNA sequencing in these cultures after six weeks of differentiation. And uh, we 
based on that, we can see here in the in this UMAP uh, the, uh, the the different dif different cells uh, that we can aggregate here um, group here based on the gene expression, and we see that it's very similar between white type and knockout cells. The main difference that we see is this population here of astrocytes that seems to be pretty specific in the B1 knockout cells. And in fact, when you see the proportion of the cells, they are increased in the B1 knockout genotype. Uh, besides that, the composition of the cell culture looks uh, fairly similar between B1 white type and knockout cells. So we don't seem to have a very strong difference in the composition, especially for glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons in these two cultures. Uh, so we use these cultures to uh, perform calcium imaging experiments, and I will show you uh, two movies using Oregon Green uh, at six weeks. So these are the bin one y type cells. So we perform these experiments uh, uh, taking image um, in a very short interval, 10 milliseconds, and you do 1,000 image. Um, and we do the same for the bin one knockout cells. And based on these uh, videos, we can then next uh, analyze the fluorescence change over time for the different cells. So here it's just an example of the cells labeled for Oregon Green. And this is one of uh, the uh, one plot showing the fluorescence intensity over time. And based on the, um, uh, the z-score, the, the standard, the, the change in the, in the fluorescence above a certain threshold, we can define the calcium spikes that we highlight here in green. And we quantify these calcium spikes uh, over time. And we see that uh, we have a slight increase in the frequency, in, in the frequency of calcium spikes in the B1 knockout neurons. We see that using Oregon Green, and we also see that using uh, GCAMP uh, under controlled by the human synapsin promoter. Um, and and uh, here, of course, it, it, we use the Oregon Green to have a larger population of cells labeled, but we can also see that with GCAMP um, that it, it's also labeling more mature cells based on the synapsin promoter. Uh, the number of active cells is more or less similar in both conditions. Uh, but one thing that we also see, and it's very interesting, when we um, correlate the, the, the spikes of one cell in the field with the other cells, we can make this kind of cross-correlation maps where we see here in the diagonal the cell with itself. So it's the strongest correlation. And green is the lowest uh, correlation. And we see that the B1 knockout cells are less uh, synchronize it, and this is, we can calculate here by the eigenvalues of this matrix, and we see that in fact the bin one knockout cells are much less synchronized. What could suggest that they are less connected? Uh, we also used some pharmacology to understand what type of currents we have in these cultures, and we could see that both blocking GABA receptors with bicuculin or AMPA receptors with CNQX, we change the activity of the cells. Interestingly, uh, by blocking GABA-A, we see that most cells uh, decrease their activity, what suggests that GABA is excitatory in these currents. And uh, according to this, when we see the expression of uh, the chloride transporters NKCC1 and KCC1, we see that these neurons express mostly NKCC1 that pumps chloride um, inside the cell, so when GABA, uh, when GABA binds to the cells, chloride goes outside the polarizing the cells. So, um, but in any case, we can see that we have functional GABA, GABAergic and glutamatergic currents, but we also see that the neurons are, uh, at least for GABAergic currents, are less, uh, um, are immature neurons in, in the six weeks cultures. Also, as I showed you before, we have this shift in the astrocyte population, and uh, this shift is, is, can also be evidence, uh, evidenced here by changes in the gene expression. And when we see the genes that this astrocyte population is expressing differently, many genes are involved in synaptic uh, um, uh, terms. What could suggest that some of the effects that we are seeing in our neurons is uh, indirectly uh, regulated by this astrocyte population change. Uh, 
because astrocytes are very well known to secrete many factors important for neuronal maturation and synaptic formation. So we decided to uh, address if this would be a cell autonomic effect in neurons by using a different method. So we uh, set a method to generate a pure neuronal culture using proneural factors. So we, we tested different factors, but I will show you here only SL1. And basically what ASL1 does, it drives directly NPCs into a neuronal phenotype. And uh, by doing that, we have 100% pure neuronal culture. And because neurons don't like to be alone, we need to add astrocytes from a, another source. So we use a, another human astrocyte uh, cell line. And by doing that, we finally have our mixed culture, but here we know that only our uh, neurons are knockout or Y type for the bin one, but the astrocytes have the same genetic background. And also this system here allows a faster and more homogeneous neuronal maturation because ASL1 will push the neuronal differentiation maturation uh, uh, much faster than we see in the spontaneous differentiation. And in fact, when we do the calcium imaging in these cultures, we can see that we have many more active cells. The neuronal yield in these cultures is much higher. And uh, uh, same thing in the, in the knockouts. And when we quantify the calcium spikes, uh, we can see if you compare only this one to that one first, that uh, we have an increase in the bin one knockout neurons, similar to what you see in the spontaneous, but even stronger. And uh, we also see that by blocking uh, uh, glutamatergic currents or gab gabaergic currents, we have uh, change in these um, um, in, the, in the, the frequency of calcium spikes, suggesting that we also have this uh, mature synapses uh, in, in this culture. Interestingly, one thing that we see in these cultures and we didn't see in the spontaneous is that uh, if you observe in the movie, you can see that there are periods when the cells are blinking together. So we have this uh, synchronization periods. When we block uh, AMPA receptors in, in these cultures, these synchronization periods disappear. And this is something that we also didn't observe in the spontaneous differentiated cells. Uh, the, that we only blo by blocking um, uh, glutamate, glutamate um, mediated synapses, we decrease the synchronization in these cultures. And we also don't see here the change between uh, Y types and knockouts that we observed in the, in the spontaneous differentiation. Uh, what could indicate that what we saw in the spontaneous differentiation was in fact a delay in the maturation rather than a, an actual effect in the synap synaptic connectivity of these cells or synaptic transmission. So finally, we did uh, uh, this, we tried to, to test also this, uh, the role of bin one in a 3D environment. And for that, we generated cerebral organoids. And uh, the cerebral organoids are directly generated from uh, uh, inducible pluripotent stem cells. And we grew these organoids up to nine months, but the, the, the results I will show you here, it's after six months and a half. Uh, we also did single cell RNA sequencing. And again, you see here a U map where you can see the different cell types, uh, glutamatergic neurons, gabaergic neurons, astrocytes, and progenitor cells. And here, if you plot by the different genotypes, we can see that uh, we have cells from the different genotypes in, in all the groups but we already can see that some neuronal group, uh, um, subgroups such as this one and this one and this one are enriched for being one heterozygous and knockout cells. And I will come back to these cell types later. And here are just showing the markers that we can use to classify these populations. Uh, using these organoids, we measured uh, electrical activity using multi-electrode arrays. Uh, the system that we used here, it's uh, what we would call a, a acute recording. So we basically put the organoid on top of this matrix of electrodes. Uh, so we, we are recording two hours after putting the organoids on top of the electrodes. So the, the, 
the signal that we see is, is very weak compared to what you usually see in a standard uh, neuronal culture in, in the, in the multi-electrode. But we can see that this signal here is, uh, disappears when we treat these cultures with CNQX or bicupolin. Um, so what indicates that they are uh, real signals and not only uh, a, a noise. But uh, of course, it would be very interesting at some point to do a more um, uh, uh, recording with uh, electrodes that could be more uh, invasive here to see a stronger signal. But in any case, uh, when we quantify the, the, the spikes in this, uh, the frequency of spikes in this um, system, we see also a slight increase in the BIN1 knockout cerebral organoids and uh, compared to Y type. Uh, but we don't see that in the heterozygous genotype. Uh, to check this electrical activity in using a different uh, uh, um, outcome, we, uh, since we had the, 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 the gene expression pattern of these different cells, we uh, hypothesized that since neurons are uh, known to, to express different sets of genes, depending on the pattern of activity. So these genes are called activity regulated genes. And it has been uh, shown that if you, neurons are exposed to a brief activity or sustained activity, they will express different waves of uh, uh, genes. So a first wave that could be, could be induced both by brief and sustained activity and are called rapid primary response genes. A second wave that is uh, at the delayed primary response genes and the third wave secondary response genes that will only be uh, regulated if you have a sustained activity. So we, we um, hypothesize it here that if we could identify uh, neurons expressing these different genes in our organoids, this could be used as a readout for electrical activity in the organoids. And uh, to do that, we used uh, um, the so-called cell ID pipeline. So this is um, um, is based on the multi uh, in, in a statistical methods to verify the enrichment of these genes. So you call this a gene signature. So you know all the genes that are involved that are rapid primary, delayed primary, or secondary response genes. And we see in which population in, in, uh, of cells these genes can be enriched. So we can very nicely see here that we see some uh, signatures associated with very specific populations. And now uh, I will bring back here the, the, the UMAP that I showed you before to show here that, we, for example, this population here is pretty much enriched in the B1 knockout and heterozygous cells. Uh, and this one, the delayed the primary response genes as well. And here's the quantification. So you can see that there is no big difference in the proportion of neurons uh, having this rapid PRG signature, but we do see a clear increase, especially in the delayed PRG, but also in the SRG genes in the BIN1 heterozygous and mainly in the BIN1 knockout organoids. So this uh, supports our uh, interpretation that cerebral, BIN1 knockout cerebral organoids are exposed to increased electrical activity. So, Finally, uh, I, we also check it some biochemical uh, um, uh, marks uh, markers for uh, usually uh, used for Alzheimer's disease models. So the first one was the concentration of amyloid beta peptides. We checked the secreted amyloid uh, beta peptides by ELISA, and um, so amyloid beta are produced from the cleavage of uh, APP. And we see here that uh, both in the spontaneous differentiation culture, now I'm back to the, to the 2D culture, and also in the SL1 induced, there is no big difference in the concentration in the, in the medium. Um, when we do that, sorry, uh, using Western blot, we also don't see any significant change in the uh, uh, APP processing towards uh, a beta uh, production. However, when we check tau phosphorylation, we see a clear increase in the uh, phosph tau phosphorylated tau in the BIN1 knockout cells. So we 
think that uh, the, either the electrical activity is increasing, tau phosphorylation, or the increased tau phosphorylation is leading to increased electrical activity. And actually, they are probably working a cycle, but we are now trying to block tau phosphorylation to see if you can rescue the phenotype in the BIN1 knockout neurons um, and establish some causal relation here. So to conclude, uh, I hope that I could convince you that the BIN1 knockout human neurons show an increase in the frequency of calcium transients and uh, also uh, increase the electrical activity directly measured by uh, multi-electrode arrays, what suggests that the deletion of BIN1 can be uh, causing an increased uh, electrical activity in the human neurons. And uh, we, I also showed you that apparently this is not due to APP processing, but rather to an increased tau phosphorylation. So I want to acknowledge the people uh, doing this work. So uh, Ortiz Saha, who is a postdoc uh, working this project, Ana Raquel, who is a student uh, in, in, from the Brain Institute, uh, a PhD student, Bruna, who is also a former member of the Brain Institute and is working now with uh, us here. Diego, who is uh, in, in finishing his PhD in the bioinformatics in the, in the UFRN. And Lucas is a master's student also there. And Alexandre uh, is a PhD student working in the single cell RNA sequencing uh, part of the project under supervision of Fabien de la Haye. And uh, Dr. Jean-Charles Lambert, who is the responsible for the group working the genetics part and all the financial support and institutions involved in this project. And I thank you very much for your attention and uh, sorry for taking a bit longer than expected. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Marcos. Great, uh, great, great talk. Um, uh, we're open for questions now, but I'll take, uh, like Diego said, I'll take the privilege for, for it uh, first. Marcus, I think my, my question is, okay, so now we have this, this been one knockout, uh, both, um, um, you know, mini brains and cells. Do you have any evidence that they senesce earlier um, than uh, wild type uh, mini brains or cells? And evidence of, of what, sorry? In, in... It's in essence, uh, you know, death, earlier, you know, cell death. Uh, we don't see that, actually, uh, based on the, on the cell culture composition, we see even uh, a slight increase in the proportion of neurons in the B1 knockout uh, organoids and also in the, in the 2D culture. Um, we don't observe that also visually um, in, in our cultures. Um, However, we see, uh, I didn't show this uh, today, but we also see that these cells have an effect, a change in the, in the endocytic trafficking. So the, the, they have uh, smaller uh, early endosomes. And when we rescue these endosomes by overexpressing BIN1, uh, especially when we overexpress the BIN1 as a form one, uh, we, and we also do this experiment in the white types, there we have a, a neurotoxic effect. So it's like, a, a, so maybe the, the a, I, I would say that probably the, the, the levels of BIN1 have to be tightly regulated. So if you go down, you may have some change in the tau interaction and then this change electrical activity. But if it goes higher, this may affect endocytic pathway and leads to cell death through another mechanism or also involved with electrical activity we don't know at this point. Um, but by deleting BIN1 itself, we don't see any clear signal of uh, neuronal degeneration um, in, at this time that we look. In, however, in the nine months organoids, uh, we have a huge neuronal cell death. Cell death. So, um, one ex possible explanation is that uh, this electrical activity, this increase in electrical activity that we are seeing uh, around six months, at some point is becoming toxic for the cells and they are dying because of the hyperactivity, but we, we still need to, to show that. I'm sorry, I think I missed, but did you, did you, do you see uh, an increase in astrocytes on the, on the brain organoids as well? No. No. 
Right. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I think um, Diego is, has raised his hand. Diego, yes. please. Uh, fantastic, fantastic talk. And congratulations on the on the quality of the histology. And not, not that I'm surprised, right? We, but um, very, Thanks. very nice. And also, <laughs> also the calcium imaging, like the, the, the quality of the, of the cells, like very, very nice. I was wondering, like, from what I... I don't, I don't know if I missed something, but so you made this, this cell cultures and the organoids where all the neurons are knockouts, right? And and so that left me wondering what's the mechanism uh, by which the activity goes down? Is it a cell mechanism or a network mechanism? So I thought whether you consider dropping knockout cells inside a wild type network and see what happens with their activity. Yeah, no, this is a very good point. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we are actually now in the in a, in a, in the moment to discuss about experiments to to, to exactly to address causal uh, uh, links, because as I mentioned, Bin One is involved in many things. Bin One is regulating uh, tau phosphorylations, regulating uh, maybe also location of calcium channels in the membrane. Um, also, uh, if it's regulating endocytosis, can, we can Im Im imagine that can be regulating also um, synaptic vesicle recycling and, and exocytosis. So there can be many possibilities um, and, uh, and they are not very uh, easy sometimes to address because they also work in cycles. So for example, increase the electrical activity, increase phosphorylation of tau, and increase phosphorylation of tau, increase electrical activity. So to disentangle what happens first is not very uh, uh, easy. But um, in the organoids, uh, we could try some experiment like this. We, like this, we could try to, to sort knockout neurons and transplant into the white type organoids. Uh, but in the 2D, that's what we try to do using the SL1. Uh, strategy. So there we have a pure neuronal knockout culture and we at least we know that by putting uh, Y-type astrocytes we still have the effect. Um, no, I know. But I'm saying just put just put a few knockout neurons within a Y-type network. Right? I think that's gonna like that, that would like guide the, the more detailed mechanistic experiments. So are you seeing mm -hmm. something that depends on the network or is some intrinsic excitability of the, of the single neuron? Yeah, 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 this is a good point. Yeah, we are trying to do that with short hairpins. Um, what? So, I mean, it's a it's a slightly different strategy. So we have a white type culture. We just put a short hairpin for bin one. So we have few neurons that are transfected. Ah, okay. So only these neurons, we have a decreased bin one expression. Um, I think yeah. Yeah. You, you could also achieve that with like very low concentrations of virus, right? With even with the Cas your Cas9 constraints, um, you could have like a few knock knockouts neurons between your array of, yeah. of wild type cells. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we could also mix them. We have now generated these IPS cell lines uh, with fluorescent reporters, so we could now mix them. Yeah. So this could be also be something uh, to, to try. Yeah, it's a good point. Oh, thanks. Okay. Hi, Marcos. Hey. Oi. Uh, so I, I guess I guess all the questions are, are going into the direction of the of those, right? Of the dose of being one. Is it either, either the number of cells that are knocked out or the inter, the internal dose, right? So it's how are you are you interpreting the results with the heterozygous cells? Right? Because at least from what I understood in the heterozygous, you, you get half expression of, of B1, right? Yeah. But you don't get the changes in the electrical activity. Not in the organoids. In the 2D culture, uh, we we don't have the results. Uh, when we started, we st we we decided to to start only with the knockout and white type cells because the, these cultures are super long, um, and uh, and the white and the heterozygous for some. I mean, this is one thing. That it's, 
we know the reason. I mean, some some cell lines there, uh, some iPS cell lines they are more difficult to differentiate uh, in, in specific lineage, and this happened for our heterozygous cell lines. It's not very easy to to differentiate them into NPCs, so we probably need to generate a new one. So we kind of uh, decide, okay, let's first check the knockout. If you see something, then we go back to the heterozygous. Right. Uh, but for the organoid, this is not an issue because it's directly from IPS. So uh, we can do the organoids uh, more easily uh, without going through this step for, of neuroinduction. And ju just uh, one more question before Kiers. Mm -hmm. So when you get the, when you use the, the synapsin promoter, do you see any activity coming from young neurons? Or it's either... We old? shouldn't, yeah, because I mean, it should be more dependent on activity of the human synapsin promoter. So it's also a way to, to, to have a more, uh, a better picture of the more mature neurons. So we kind of decrease this variability of neuronal maturation by using that. Um, uh, and uh, well, I didn't show that because we, we this is uh, still something that we are analyzing. You show something on KCC1 expression, right? So the, the gabaritic neurons are not expressing it. So they can maybe not get immature at all. No, no, it's the, that's all neurons actually there. I mean, that this is just a chloride transporter. So it just shifts the, the the, the, the gradient of chlor uh, the chloride uh, gradient instead of being out outside and, and low inside it's the opposite and I mean this happens in the brain during development uh, it's a known uh, feature I mean GABA is excitatory at early uh, stage of brain development because of the predominance of this uh, chloride transporter and then after uh, in the rats for example in the mice this happens around p5 p7 you have um, um, the any KCC1 goes down, KCC1 and 2 goes up, and then you, GABA becomes uh, inhibitory. And what happens there in the uh, B1 cultures with KCC1? Is it normal? In the spontaneous differentiation, uh, we see any KCC1, but we don't see KCC1, KCC2. So explaining why GABA is excitatory. In the ACL1 induced cells, uh, we are waiting for the sequencing. But uh, based on what you see in the pharmacology, we should expect a higher expression of KCC1 because we see GABA being inhibitory in these cultures. Very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Marcus. Very uh, nice yeah. talk. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm, maybe you said it and I missed it, but um, with the increased excitability and this becoming toxic eventually and you having all this uh, sequencing data did you look at calcium handling proteins or calcium buffers did you see any poorer buffering in these cells or was it the same we didn't look at the protein level but in the gene expression level we don't see any significant change so when you look i mean that the, when you compare gene expression with glutamatergic neurons in the 2d or in the organoid culture we have very few genes differently expressed, 30, 35 genes. Uh, and uh, then it was easy to go through all of the genes, but we don't see any, uh, um, uh, we don't see calcium channels. We don't see um, calcium buffering proteins. So it doesn't seem to be related to, to uh, uh, changing the expression of the proteins Although it could be localization, for example, but the expression, uh, I don't think it's the case. Thanks. Thank you. Um, fantastic, Marcus. Uh, for, thank you for the brilliant talk. Um, we're actually going a little bit over, so... Uh, Gonna it's always to... my fault. <laughs> no, no, no. We had, we had, we were already late. So we were, okay. but we're, we're getting more and more late. Uh, so I just would like to thank you again and you. Um, bring up our next uh, speaker, which is Professor uh, Claudio Queiroz. Um, Claudio, I, are I, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm just trying to figure out, uh, organize a little bit my desktop. To, to... Oh, no, no. We are competing for who has the worst desktop ever. 
I'm winning so far. You can see mine. So, can you see my, my, my screen or not? Let me see. Yes. Yes? Now you see the presentation because something changed here. I cannot see um, my my Zoom screen. I'm not really used to Zoom. Um, okay. So just to to everybody can see my screen, right? I just put my clock. So, well, I just. Well, I would like to thank Tarciso and Diego for organizing such a nice meeting uh, as everybody else before me has already acknowledged. Uh, so thank you very much for the honor. I, mean, I would say it's an honor to speak in the in this symposium. Um, and after yesterday, I changed a little bit my presentation in order to show the data, uh, not only of my latest student working on the topic of high frequency oscillations in epilepsy, but also to bring and remember previous students uh, that contribute to my lab uh, and of course to the Brain Institute itself. So I change a little bit the title and uh, we could add like a subtitle, what we have learned after 10 years. So since it's 10 years that I've been working in this topic uh, at the Brain Institute. So as you remember or may know, one of the goals of my lab or of our group is to understand what are the neural correlates of behavior seizures and epilepsy. Uh, remembering that uh, epilepsy is a disease where spontaneous seizures with spontaneous and recurrent seizures occur. And it seems that there is a strong relationship between what's going on behaviorally and what you record using electrophysiological measures. So here you can see a tonic-clonic seizure and uh, this um, activity is correlated with changes in excitability of the brain. And usually people think that uh, uh, if we understand how this um, electrophysiological uh, fluctuation or dynamics occur, we may understand how epilepsy and therefore uh, um, seizures occur. So that's one of the goals of the lab. And I will talk a little bit about one of, of, of uh, electrophysiological marker of epilepsy. So when we, so in this previous uh, slide, I show you that you have a seizure here, and this seizure were recorded using scalp electrode in human patients with epilepsy, of course. But uh, patients with epilepsy, they are not presenting seizures all the time. So there's a large amount of time that they spend without seizures. And these epochs are called interictal, so between seizures. And during the inter interictal activity, we can see that the occurrence of some abnormal electroactivity that uh, they are called uh, interictal epileptic form spikes. Uh, and if we look into more detail, not with electrodes placed on the top of the skull, or, or at least in, in the head, uh, like non-invasively, uh, if we put an electrode inside the brain, in the mesial areas of the human brain, we would see that this interictal activity that looks kind of small in the EEG, uh, with depth electrodes, they are huge, they are big, and also bigger is the recording of the seizure itself. So it seems that uh, as closer to the network, the leptogenic network you are, the better is the resolution of your uh, electrophysiological activity. And of course, you can go, as Marcos has shown brilliantly in his talk, uh, we can go to the slice recordings, we can patch, for example, either uh, extra or put an electrode just a cellular recorded or even intracellularly recorded. And that's what people have done in the past. And what we show, uh, what they have shown uh, is that the interictal spike is really associated with change in the dynamics of, um, of neurons itself. And this change uh, specifically that we are looking here that correlates with the uh, extracellular uh, in non-invasive EEG recording is what we call the um, paroxysmal depolarization shift. So in the past, when they described this occurrence of this intracellular activity and associated with the interictal spike, this was work from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The idea was that the epilepsy was associated with um, uh, a pathology of the neuron and not a pathology of the network. So this drive research 
towards identifying genetic alterations of ion channels, receptor transporters that has been associated with a genetic epilepsies. However, uh, in 1999, so the end of the last millennia, uh, there was a very important paper published by Anatole Bragin uh, in the UCLA uh, showing that um, kinetic treated rats, so kinetic acid is a, as a drug or as a neurotoxin used to induce seizures and epilepsy in, in animals, uh, they do show a very different uh, oscillation, uh, so a novel oscillation that has never been shown before. And this has, has been named like high frequency oscillation or pathological high frequency oscillation uh, in regions traditionally associated with uh, temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, these high frequency oscillations were also observed in human epileptic brain as you can see here. And the frequency of these oscillations change a bit from, for example, in the brain, human brain from 120 Hertz to up to 600 Hertz in the rat. Um, a lot of people thought that, okay, is that fast oscillation something uh, resembling the ripples that have been described a couple of years before by, by Bushaki and Kenzo Weiss uh, in the CA1 region. So here we can see the occurrence of ripple associated with the sharp wave. So people was thinking, oh, is this a ripple or is this a, something new? Um, then Bragin and, and Busaki together showed that in fact in human epileptic patients you can observe both activities. So you can observe both ripples here around 96 hertz and you can observe a peak of a very fast oscillation that now they call it a fast ripple. So you have the ripple and now you have the fast ripple. And it seems that fast ripples are really a biomarker of the epileptic tissue. Also very interesting, this fast ripple could be recorded uh, in a very local network. So in this paper of 2002, they showed that two electrodes placed in the dente gyrus, they can present fast activity or fast ripples uh, that were not recorded in other electrodes. And this was, was spread all over the limbic system or at least in the temporal uh, structures uh, of the limbic system. Uh, so this is a, just a review that I put together about the changes depending on whether you are in the in the hippocampus and entorhinocortex, or I will only show the hippocampus here, but depending on where you are, the frequency of this pathological uh, fast oscillation can change. So in the dente gyrus, for example, this could be around 250 hertz, but if you are, um, in the, in the CA1 area, you can see the ripples here around 150, and then you can see something faster, um, probably above 300 hertz. And if you go to the subiculum, um, you can even see um, fast ripples as well here. And this, this, the occurrence of these fast ripples depends on this, the layer of the structure or where you are recording from. So it seems to be a very localized uh, activity of the epileptic brain. Um, so, and, and then at that time, people think, okay, usually seizures and epilepsy are thought to be a, some sort of imbalance between excitation and inhibition. So people try to understand what are the differences in excitation and inhibition um, on the mechanism uh, that generates this fast oscillation. So in a very nice paper of uh, Lisette, uh, they show in slice, in CA1 and CA3, that control animals do show uh, the fast oscillation around uh, that frequency here is a little bit higher because it's slice. You have to treat these slice with some things in order for them to produce this fast activity. But in epileptic animals, she showed that the fast ripples has two blobs. So one much, well, one with a higher frequency and the other similar to what has been shown before. Uh, and interestingly, the, the frequency between the ripples and the fast ripple, they correlate. So it seems that fast ripples and ripples are somehow the same activity, uh, or at least they are generated by the same network. But you know, in some way, the fast ripple are corrupted ripples. Uh, so she treated the nice thing about slides is that you can add drugs and then quantify how this uh, change the dynamics and then they add NBQX, uh, glutamatergic 
antagonist, and you can see that uh, uh, the fast activity disappear. So it seems that maybe there is something to do with glutamatergic transmission. But interestingly, when you add diazepam, that also increase inhibition, uh, you also see a disappearance of the fast activity. So it seems that both excitation and inhibition play a role in coordinating the activity of the, uh, this very fast oscillation. Um, so in 2009, that was the year when I arrived uh, in Natal, so um, a little bit more than 10 years ago. Um, again, Bragin published a very interesting paper where he add bicuculin in the hippocampus of uh, freely moving animals and show that depending on the animal, the beginning of the seizure could be different. So as you can see here, each line is one different animal and you can see that this, the seizure starts in a very different way. Some seizures starts immediately, other seizures takes longer to appear, um, but some seizures start with a negative spike, other seizures start with a positive spike. So there is a, a mixture. So when he quantify each one of these uh, interictal activity or these spikes, epileptiform spikes, he showed that as the spikes progressed, uh, there was an appearance of high frequency oscillation, uh, mainly in the dentagyrus and CA3 areas. So I, I just want you to keep in mind this information because that's where I start my research program here in Natal. And um, one of the first students that I have, in fact, the first student that I have at the Brain Institute tried to ask this question. So can we manipulate synaptic plasticity uh, in order to interfere with the expression of pathological high frequency oscillations in chronic epileptic freely moving animals? So that's the work done by Kelly, my, my former uh, PhD student. She defended her master thesis in 2012. Uh, and for those who remember it now, this is the operation uh, uh, room where and this is the first implant that we perform in Natal. It was really nice to hear the cells and to have the rat here, uh, the omnetics uh, technology, and this is the stimulation electrode. Uh, and fortunately, we did manage to, to observe high frequency oscillations either in the dente gyros. I apologize for the slides being in Portuguese, but I hope you understand. And we can see clear here the, the what we call the dente spike together with a high frequency oscillation, a little bit above uh, 100, 200 Hertz, in, in the case of the Dante gyrus, 250 and CA3, even with an harmonic of up to 500 Hertz. So it was really nice to see in Natal for the first time, the, the recording of high frequency oscillations, pathological high frequency oscillations. So what Kelly did, she applied one pulse of stimulation every uh, five seconds in, during long period of time and record the, the EPSP and the population spike. And we showed that after such a long stimulation period, the population spike decreases its amplitude. Uh, so if you compare this window with that window, we can see that there is a, some sort of long-term depression of the spike. So my, the question was, okay, since we, we were able to decrease the excitability of this network, what is the impact in the high frequency, pathological high frequency oscillations of the epileptic rats? So uh, we have done many quantifications. I'm just showing here the one, what we call the pathological high frequency oscillation index. And we show that indeed after the stimulation, there was a decrease in the, uh, in the let's say pathological uh, activity of this high frequency oscillation. Interestingly, uh, the seizure uh, frequency was also reduced in these animals. So very promising, uh, very interesting. But unfortunately, uh, in 2011, we have to move to a new building uh, in a new situation and uh, doing experiment was not possible anymore. So we, in fact, we never managed to, to, to reproduce this data and in order to have more animals. Here I'm showing the data from one single animal. That's the one we managed to do. Um, what is a pity? So since we moved to a new facility where no experimentation was possible, uh, we, well, no lab available here, we, we try to answer a different question using data collected by others. So we moved to a former collaboration of mine in Sao Paulo, uh, the UNIPETS is a, is a unit center for um, surgery in epileptic patients. And then we asked, okay, can we identify these pathological high frequency oscillations in humans with refractory epilepsy during resection of the epileptic focus. 
So these patients went to the surgery room, they put electrodes on top of the cortex, they record their activity for 20 minutes, something like this. And we analyze this data to see whether there is something, some relationship between the occurrence of this high frequency oscillation and the history or the outcome of the surgery. Uh, and this work was done by Anderson Brito, uh, 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 P, a master's student of mine uh, coming from uh, Maranhão, San Luis, and now he's working in Newcastle, UK. I don't know if he's here with us today, but uh, this was his work. So this is the uh, X-ray showing the location of the electrodes in the brain. There are many co different configurations, and we have this sort of data. So Anderson developed nice uh, algorithms to identify parameters of high-frequency oscillations, but unfortunately, uh, we didn't find any correlation between high-frequency oscillations recording during surgery. So there is some anesthesia uh, uh, going on. Some, well, some the, the electrode was just placed, so it's acute location of the electrode. So we we didn't find any change in HFO duration, high-frequency oscillations duration uh, regarding the outcome of the surgery. That's this angle scale. Um, the, the, the higher the scale, the worse is the, the epileptic condition. So there is no uh, relation. And we also didn't observe any correlation between the time, the life with epilepsy and the amount of high frequency oscillations recorded during surgery. So unfortunately, it's just to, to, to tell the story that not all projects leads to uh, uh, what you expect as a positive result. Sometimes you follow the literature and you, you reach at that end. And for that reason, unfortunately, we never publish these results. So that's also a good opportunity to remember this type of work that Anderson has done and contributed to the construction of the Institute. So the first third, the third question that I want to discuss here um, is occurred after I made a, a trip with Rodrigo uh, to attend the, the Brazilian uh, epilepsy meeting in Foz de Iguaçu in 2014. And at that time, the lab, the Institute was able to, to provide us with a lab so we can do some recordings and we test whether there was some different, whether there is difference between uh, status epilepticus triggered by cholinergic uh, agonists like pilocarpine or glutamatergic agonists as kinetic acid. And this work was done by Rafael uh, Bessa. Uh, I'm sure that he's hearing, listening to us. So what Bessa did, he implanted animals, uh, let the animals recover, and then inject intrapocampally uh, kinetic acid of pilocarpine. And what we found that was very interesting is that during the status epilepticus, because we observe many different types of after discharge, so what we call the A, B, C, D, and E type. Uh, and then when we quantify this A, B, C type, we show that the, the, the occurrence of these events, they, they change in time. So the status epilepticus, once considered a single entity, in fact, is the collection of a multitude uh, of uh, epileptic form activity that was triggered by the drug, by in case, in this case, kinetic acid. Uh, when Bessa did the same recordings of, with pilocarpine, pilocarpine induces such a stronger activity that no difference was uh, uh, could be observed at all. Uh, and this was reproduced by all animals treated with kinetic acid. And the conclusion that we reached was that, uh, in fact, pilocarpine was producing a much stronger, much severe uh, status epilepticus. And therefore, it didn't allow the brain to, to, to develop the platform activity uh, in time. Uh, but one thing that I want to draw your attention to was one of the results collected by Rafael Bessa was uh, the, the, the image that I used in the opening of my talk. Uh, this image is a highlight of this epoch here. So just a couple of minutes after the administration of kyanic acid, we do see some very fast oscillation going on. Uh, and this electrode I didn't mention is in the granular cell layer uh, of the hippocampus. And when we highlight, for example, this event here, we can see a very nice uh, and strong high frequency oscillation. Uh, and this suggests us that maybe high frequency oscillations are not really a, a, a marker of uh, epileptic tissue, but could be induced by drugs, could be just, just if you mix up with the uh, excitation of the brain, uh, some of the structures will generate this high frequency oscillation 
uh, despite not being epileptic in nature. So, uh, and this is just a uh, uh, spectrogram showing that the first seizure and the first uh, 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 seizure that we observed, this pathological high frequency oscillation, we can see that has a higher frequency that decrease in time and then stabilize, right? It gets stable in time. Uh, so this led to a fourth research question is that do pathological high frequency oscillations emerge from corrupted physiological ripples or just after epileptogenesis. So this is just a theoretical uh, scheme showing that you induce status epilepticus. And then you can imagine that uh, uh, you observe an increase in the pathological high frequency oscillations in time that correlates with a period that we call epileptogenesis. And combined with that, you would expect a decrease in the rate or the structure of ripples. So if pathological high frequency oscillations are corrupting ripples, when you see an increase of one of these activity, you should see a decrease of the other. Or the, and then of course, after a while, you see the spontaneous seizures uh, uh, appearing um, that define the end of the epileptogenesis period, right? So we want to look to these dynamics because uh, an alternative hypothesis would be that, okay, you have the status epilepticus and the high frequency oscillations just come up during the status epilepticus. So you don't need to, to, to have uh, neuronal loss, synaptic reorganization in order to observe these high frequency oscillations. And, the ch and maybe the change in ripples, the decrease in ripple rate is just a cons consequence of this uh, high frequency oscillations. And this work um, has been done by uh, Johnny's uh, an um, actual master student uh, in our lab. And we expected to defend his master uh, thesis in this year during the pandemics. So one thing that uh, John's did, and I, I also recommend to all the students that are listening to this talk, you, you should, when you start doing a research uh, study, uh, your project, you need to look to the literature. And that's what he did. He did some sort of uh, uh, systematic review. She, she, she searched for these uh, terms in, in PubMed and Web of Science. Uh, try to, to see whether, what are the numbers uh, regarding the pathological high frequency oscillation, the pathological ripples and the ripples itself. And surprisingly, even though there, there are more than 22 years since the first description of the pathological high frequency oscillations, only 26 papers report the numbers that we are interested in. That is the frequency, the power, the rate, the duration, and when these uh, uh, high frequency oscillations occur. Uh, and when we combine all these studies, what we found is that indeed um, pathological high frequency oscillations because of the definition of this event uh, has a much higher frequency than the ripples. So it seems that might be a, a, a beating effect. So it's just doubling the ripple in a non-synchronized way and you can produce these high frequency oscillations. But the duration of these events are shorter and the rates, they are much shorter than the ripples. So the question John's asked, okay, so what happens when we develop the status epileptic model and follow the occurrence of these high frequency oscillations in time? So these are very preliminary data. Uh, in fact, this figure was produced yesterday. Uh, these are one example of an animal during, uh, before the induction of the status epilepticus. You can see here different channels. These are electrodes placed in the cortex. These are electrodes places, placed in the hippocampus. And we can see this uh, high frequency oscillation in the ripple range, surprisingly for us, both in the cortex and in the hippocampus, while the other electrodes might be misplaced, right? So we just we just we give just a flash, a quick look on this uh, type of activity that resembles a ripple activity. So these are three different animals. Each row here is a different uh, animal, and what we can see is that there are some animals that vary. So the status epilepticus were produced here, and what we see in the columns are two days before the status epilepticus, one day before the status epilepticus, one day after the status epilepticus. Of course, we didn't, uh, I will not going to show you the, the, the data of the status epilepticus itself, but I just want to tell you that we, we reproduce the, the findings uh, of BESA. 
So the high frequency oscillations appeared in the first minutes after the administration of the neurotoxin with either the kainic acid and the pilocarpine. Uh, and to reach this conclusion based on the pilocarpine, we had to decrease the dose of pilocarpine. So it was very uh, uh, important uh, knowledge that we gained uh, from these experiments. And when we follow for 10 days, um, so day two and day 10, we see that in fact, the high frequency oscillation or the ripple that we observe here, uh, decrease its frequency, decrease its amplitude and decrease its rate. Um, but this seems not to be the case for all animals, right? So you can see that these animals, uh, uh, this animal particularly, might not show this change in, in, in high frequency oscillation. When you look to the, the, the severity of the status epilepticus, uh, and I'm asking, I'm waiting for Johns to compute this nicely, but it seems that this animal has a very severe, for sure, has a very severe status epilepticus. This animal has a moderate status epilepticus, and this ma uh, mouse has a mild status epilepticus. So it seems that the effect of uh, the status epilepticus, that is very long and sustained seizure, um, in the ripples may depend on the amount of the excitability that was going on in, in this network, probably leading to cell death uh, and synaptic reorganization. Uh, so the conclusions uh, is just that we can manipulate high frequency oscillation using uh, protocols traditionally used to produce uh, long-term depression or decreased synaptic plasticity. Um, human epileptic brain do show high frequency oscillations, although their occurrence were not correlated with surg uh, surgery, surgical outcome, nor with the life with epilepsy. Uh, animal models of status epilepticus offer a unique opportunity to study the, to study the temporal dynamics of both physiological and pathological high frequency oscillation, but essential difference regarding the toxin used to trigger the status of lactose may exist. So we learned that kinic acid and pilocarpine, even though they are treated as similar drugs to produce similar status of lactose, this might not be the case. Uh, so both kinic acid and pilocarpine can acutely induce pathological high frequency oscillation. So you don't need to have a pathological network to generate these abnormal oscillations. Um, and finally, suppression or attenuation of physiological ripples may depend on the severity of the status epilepticus. I thank you all for your attention and for the university that has been supporting the Brain Institute all these years and the funding agency. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Claudio, for the fantastic talk. Um, we are open for questions. Uh, I'll, I'll just do a quick one, just just to to start things. Um, Claudio, so so you you were you're you're telling us, and I'm very I don't know anything about epilepsy. You're telling us, you know, they are different, uh, pilocarpin and kyanic acid. Um, if you were, if you were to choose one of these models, which one do you think uh, mimics better what you what do you observe in humans? So I didn't show other results from the lab, but um, it's, I believe both of them, in fact, they are modeling different things. So when you look to the clinic of temporal lobe epilepsy, it's common to observe two types of patients. Patients that do show uh, temporal lobe, uh, mesiotemporal lobe sclerosis. So you see a reduction in the hippocampal volume. You see a reduction of the temporal areas, structures. Uh, but there are some other patients with the same behavioral seizures, the same etiology, and even the same response to drugs um, that do not show this neurodegeneration. That's, of course, visible in uh, MRI uh, imaging, right? So you have these two forms of, of uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, and usually um, there is some discussion whether one of the, the, the forms are better treated than the other uh, based on um, traditional anticonvulsant uh, drugs, antiepileptic drugs or anti-seizure drugs. Um, interestingly, when you treat the animal with kyanic acid, you see a massive loss of pyramidal cells. So CA3 is gone. Iller region is gone. Uh, in mice, uh, and this does with the work of Daniela Mora, um, and uh, Igor Salis that uh, is also here listening to us. Uh, they show, we show that 
a kinetic acid, for example, induce a very strong granular cell dispersion. So the cells get very, the, the layer of the granular cells get wider, bigger, thicker. Uh, surprisingly, pilocarpine that induce a stronger status epilepticus do not lead to this massive cell death, both in CA3 uh, and also do not lead to granular cell dispersion. So one thing that we are working on is that these models, they are complementary because uh, uh, they, they can produce status epilepticus, they can produce seizures, but uh, with different effects on the population of hippocampal principal cells. So the kinetic acid would be a model for temporal lobe epilepsy with hippocampal sclerosis and the pilocarpine without. Uh, surprisingly, even though the pilocarpine model was developed by a Brazilian, so this is important to say, so Professor Esper Cavaleiro uh, was the one uh, who proposed the use of pilocarpine as a, um, a drug to study epilepsy. Uh, very few studies use pilocarpine applied directly inside the hippocampus. So I believe we will be the first group to show uh, how uh, pilocarpine applied directly inside the hippocampus uh, generates a status or characterize uh, or develop. Um, so we did a dose response curve with pilocarpine inside the hippocampus. Then, and then that's when we learn that the, depending on the dose of pilocarpine use, you may or you may not see the high frequency oscillations. And then this information I took out of the, of the presentation, but I would say they are complementary Tarsisa. They are not excluded, they are not similar, they are complementary. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have a couple uh, questions. I think uh, we can go in alphabetical order, uh, Davi. Uh, feel free to open your mic and um, ask directly. Um, hi, Claudio. Great uh, talk. Uh, so Thank in you. the beginning of uh, your presentation, you showed uh, a difference in frequency between the HFO, uh, the high frequency oscillations in the dentate gyres and the, in CA1, right? And it, I think it was not generated by a, a, a drug. It was a... a, a Chronic epileptic animals. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you think, uh, what are the insights uh, about this difference? And if you, uh, I will ask to, to you if you think this fade in frequency is uh, related to a, an upstream in the, the circuit or an up, uh, how do you think this difference occur? Why do you think? So um, pyramidal cells, usually they, they fire higher, uh, they have a higher, I believe you are talking about this uh, image, right? No, uh, actually you, you showed oh. uh, an image before, right in the beginning of your presentation uh, that uh, showed difference between the, the frequency in the dentate gyres and the, in CA1 region. Yeah, this one, right? Yeah, yeah, this one. What, uh, what do you think about this? How this, uh, in, later in, the, in the, the presentation, you said it, it would be the same pattern generator. Or it's, it's the same thing, but with different frequencies. But uh, what accounts for this different in frequency? Well, the, the only thing I can imagine is the connectivity of the principal cells. So the granular cells, they are connected in a very particular way that even though when you look to the histology and you see the cell bodies, the cell, the soma of these principal cells very tied together, they have a very different connectivity. Uh, for example, in vivo, it's already known that CA1 can fire at a higher frequency. CA1 neurons fire, so pyramidal uh, CA1 neurons and CA3 neurons, they have place field. Um, they present this selectivity in space and then can fire at a very high rate. Granular cells, uh, conversely, granular cells do not fire higher during um, uh, awaking. Uh, they do not show uh, a very precise and localized place fields. Um, so there are definitely differences in connectivity between these groups of neurons, these two types of uh, uh, structures that um, explain but I, I don't know, I, I cannot tell you why, uh, what are the connectivity itself that generates. Before, right, so something is before, a pattern generator is uh, uh, upstreaming uh, uh, synapse to the dentate gyrus, then to CA1. 
There is a common yeah. uh, region before, right? Do you know about this region? Or yeah, so, so the entorhinal cortex here, we already know that the layer two, for example, projects to the uh, CA1 uh, and layer three, sorry, the layer two projects to, to the Brenner cells while layer three projects to the, to the CA1. You have also difference in layer two and three projecting to the outer molecular layer of the dentate gyrus of the granular cells, the middle molecular layer of the dentigar. So there is differences, of course, in connectivity, both from incoming formation uh, from the cortex, but also inside the network itself. So the, the feedback connectivity in the, in the dentigar is much stronger than the feedback connectivity in CA1, for example. But I, I, I don't know, David. I, in fact, I don't know what are the, what are the, the, the components that contribute to the, the differences in frequency of this high frequency oscillation. I don't know the answer. Thanks, great talk. Fantastic. Uh, I think Ernesto has a question for you, and then we're going we're gonna to close the, the session. Thank you, Claudio. Beautiful presentation. Uh, Thank you, Ernesto. So uh, you are delivering these uh, epileptogenic drugs directly into the hippocampuses, right? Yes. So uh, have you tried with, I'm sure you did, I mean, uh, you, you just delivered to one of the hippocampus, just only one hemisphere, or yes. maybe you uh, have you tried this and see how this epileptic focus, induced epileptic, pharma, pharma, chemically induced focus on one uh, hemisphere, how it may, con con what is it, what's the word? To, to propagate, uh, propagate spread. Yes, to spread to the other one. And can you talk about this, please? Yeah, so thanks for the question. It's a very interesting question. Uh, we have implanted bilaterally, so we have electrodes both placed, because the idea was, okay, I want to produce an epileptic focus on, in only one hippocampus. And then we learned that this is not possible. Uh, and even though we have the left and right hippocampus, I would say that, in fact, we are just talking about one single uh, structure. So because the connectivity between them are so strong. And what we found is that once the platform activity start in one of the hemisphere, uh, it propagates to the other really fast. And surprisingly, when you see the fast high frequency oscillations in one hemisphere that usually are localized oscillations, they are very correlated. They are very uh, correlated with the, the same high frequency oscillations in the other hemisphere. So it, it seems to me that both hippocampus, uh, both hippocampi, they, they work as a, a single entity. However, it's, it's, it's important to say, uh, and we have a lot of animals recorded so far, that the region where you inject the drug, because of the volume or maybe the pH or the osmolarity or something that's going on, change uh, the potential. So the ipsilateral recordings show a clear attenuation of the signal. So the amplitude of the evoked potential or the spontaneous activity is reduced. Um, and the other side that is like drug free or solution free or volume free, uh, show a much stronger uh, um, pathological efficacy of this, suggesting that we have a localized activity, so drug-driven high-frequency oscillation, but you have also a network-driven high-frequency oscillation. And this discussion we did in a, a Daniela Mora's paper uh, published, I think, last year or two years ago, something like this. Thank you, Ernesto, for the question. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Claudio, there's there's one question. I don't know if you can read the chat and you can read directly the question uh, I, from Junior. Um, I'm just reading the question now. Just just for the sake yeah, of you. So it's the same, Junior. The, the color code uh, is the same. Fantastic. Um, you mean the, the power, right? The color code in the in the heat map, uh, in, the, uh, in the spectrogram is, is the same. 
I, I have another question, Claudia. Yeah, here is the same here. They're all the same. I'm sorry, I didn't put the color bar here. Uh, I'll put it now. Uh, uh, Claudio. Yes. Is it possible to to do a reverse to to try to play around with reversible uh, induction of epilepsy? So you would deliver your drug, your epileptogenic drug, and then at short moments, right after this drug, you deliver an antagonist, right? So you would have like five minutes of pilocarpin or whatever uh, induction uh, and another group where you would have 10 minutes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is this possible or not really? Um, I believe it's possible. Um, in fact, when I was a PhD student, I did an experiment similar to that that we, we just published uh, after I maybe like 15 years. In fact, it's a collection of many results that were never published and we just join everything together and publish like a, some sort of like a, like the talk I did, no? Uh, and Straight what we did, barrel. yeah, I mean, uh, put everything together. Uh, so what we did is uh, we, we induced um, epilepsy with pilocarpin, but this was systemic injection, right? And right after it, we treated with scopolamine that's an antagonist of the of, of, uh, of cholinergic transmission. Uh, what we found, so for our surprise, if you administer a scopolamine 30 minutes after the status epilepticus has started, uh, it doesn't change the, the, the status epilepticus. So it's like pilocarpine is just pushing the system towards uh, hyposynchronicity or epileptiform activity. But if you block cholinergic transmission, uh, you do not see uh, an abortion of the status epilepticus. However, too late. Yeah, it's too late. Yeah, and but however, if you look to the dynamics or the spectral component of the status, this changed completely. So it seems that in this case, uh, cholinergic transmission is uh, necessary uh, to to generate the patterns that we observe during the status epilepticus, but it's not sufficient to to block it once it has started. Maybe with intracerebral injections, you can have a more temporally precise control and you may be able to abort this effect. And maybe you can see that, I don't know, at five minutes of pilocarpin, you don't have uh, an induction of all the, the uh, further symptoms or whatever, but yeah. at seven minutes, you will, something like this, I don't know. Yeah, this is a very interesting experiment and unfortunately we have, haven't done yet. Uh, what is important to say, and that's what I, we learned because we switched from rats to mice for economical reasons and also genetic reasons. But also um, we, we learned that in mice, most of the animals, they can uh, um, okay. abolish the status epilepticus spontaneously. So we will observe remission of the status epilepticus spontaneously. And that's why uh, in this image we have this mild SE. So this mild SE is an animal that did have the status epilepsy because it lasts maybe for a hundred minutes, but after that period uh, it stops uh, having the, the having seizures and even it start having slow oscillations that are typical from uh, slow wave sleep. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Claudio, so much again. Um, I, I hate to cut it short. I know there's more questions coming, but we are well over our schedule and uh, we have some speakers in the afternoon that have a hard deadline. So um, I would like to ask everybody to be back here by 1.30. I know it's going to be a short lunch, 40-minute uh, lunch. Um, I'm sorry, but um, because, because we have some speakers late in the afternoon that cannot um, they have to do something else afterwards. Uh, I would like to, to try to get back on schedule for the afternoon sessions. So I'm sorry, Adriano, but um, I'm going to ask you to, to be back here at, at, at uh, 1 30. Sure, I mean, I'm not going anywhere, so I'm, I'm already here. That's <laughs> All right. So um, it's going to be a short lunch, and I'll see you. Uh, like Diego said, if you guys want to keep this session open as you know you can stay here and just shut your mics and cameras on and then we'll come back um, uh, so you have to avoid the 
the going in and coming back from from uh, Gatter. Um, but thank you again. I would like to thank Claudio, uh, Marcus, um, and Kia for for the excellent talks. And I'll see you guys back here in uh, forty minutes. <laughs>